God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good all the time. Hello, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you with us. We're spread out. It looks strange. <laughs> this is going to be strange. Barb and I were down here Thursday night. Thank Barb. You, know, you don't know how much work she does for me. She gets these songs together and puts them on the computer. And I'm the one that has to run this thing. You might be in trouble. <laughs> There's a, there a couple of them that gave us a little fist, but you know, but thank you for that. It really helps me out. Uh, we have just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you are visiting with us, please fill out a visitor's card and uh, give that to us later on, and so we can have a record of your attendance. Uh, they're not really visiting this morning. Uh, David and Bella are here, and uh, they are staying with the Gillespies this weekend, getting some things done. And with that in mind, it says here they're here almost. But I see them, so it's not almost. But we welcome uh, welcome them to the family. And uh, if you can, uh, they have leased a place. Uh, the address is in the bulletin. And they plan to arrive next Saturday with a 26-foot U-Haul van. So uh, it says here, the congregation is cordially invited to help feed them. <laughs> now, I was there <laughs> at Dutch Valley. <laughs> David can put it away, so... <laughs> We're, uh, anyway, if you can, uh, if you need to help move and get the unloading of the van, they should arrive sometime late afternoon, early evening. That is on Saturday, is that correct? Okay, I saw it, I read it, but I wanted to make sure it was what it was. So, read the bulletin, get that information, and help us out if you can, please. Also, this Wednesday, we are going to have three additional security cameras uh, put on the uh, outside of the building uh, to help with... Uh, some things that have been going on. I think uh, Mark Burfield is taking charge of all of this, and we really thank him uh, for that. And uh, also visiting with us, sort of. Lance has been here a couple times here. He, he, he the last time, first time he spoke here not too long ago, uh, we never had another service for you know like almost three months. <laughs> we shut it down. Yeah. And. Uh, but he was with us on last weekend. Uh, he's uh, with us this morning this week. His wife is also with us and welcome you uh, to the Dover congregation. And uh, so, and then next Sunday is uh, Brother Harry Ogletree will be here. And uh, he can he can either open it up or close it down again. So I don't, I don't know. But uh, we're we so glad that you are here and uh, look forward to hearing Brother Lance speak again this morning. Uh, I've got a, a Helen Thompson. This is Robin Miller's mother. She was, uh, they were here last week or the week before, I think. And most of you know, you know, know them. Uh, her mother fell. Her name again, her name is Helen Thompson. She fell and broke her hip. So uh, we need to pray for her uh, when you do. Please do that. I don't know. Is there anything else that uh, I don't see? So if you have things for the, the uh, bulletin, make sure you get them to Barb. So there are always things that need to be done. It's kind of hard to follow any kind of schedule this year because nothing's really happening. So uh, kind of, we need some news. Mike, Sir. Greg Evans of Christ Church has COVID. Greg Evans? Greg Evans. Yeah. You married Carolyn? Yeah. New Philly, yeah. Schumann. Okay. Schumann, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Greg Evans, yeah, he's, he's been ill before, I remember. Uh, so he, he has been diagnosed with COVID, so uh, I think he's changed some things too. Maybe start Ah, yes, that's right. That, that was part of it, I forgot it. Uh, David is our, our new minister. He starts on uh, August the 2nd, so he gets uh, its tomatoes ready, and uh, <laughs> we'll all sit right here. But uh, thank all those who helped us move the, uh, the pews on uh, Wednesday. Wednesday? I think it was Wednesday. I lose, I lose sight of the, the days of the week since we don't church in the middle of the week right now. So uh, thanks for everyone who did that. And, and please you know, understand why and spread out a little bit. So it looks pretty good this morning. So the center was a little empty if you come here because people aren't used to doing that yet. So you guys are new. So <laughs> at your seat. Uh, I believe that's all I've got. <clears throat> now, a little disclaimer on the songs. Um, they're all up here, and hopefully it goes well. And uh, we, we had to fight with one, so <laughs> we'll see if it works. I hope it does. You are my all in all. My power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, 
supposed to be some direction as I was doing. Pushing myself in the corner. You are my strength when I am weak. You are that treasure that I see. You are my all
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning in my precious faith to sing these songs to you, to talk to you in prayer, and to worship your high and holy name. We thank you for the ability that you have given to us to arise this morning and to come here. We pray, Father, for this country, for the world over, as we continue to deal with the pandemic. We pray, Father, for those who are in charge of in, in charge of their duties, whether it be the president, or the governor, or the mayor, a king. We ask, Father, that you give them wisdom to make the right decisions to lead us. And we pray, Father, for open hearts that we would listen to what they have to say. We pray for those who are working diligently to find a cure, to uh, help us to get back to a new normal. But Father, we also pray for those who are hurting, who are suffering with this disease, and who are suffering, period, whether it be from an illness or from an accident. We ask that you look down upon them and comfort them. Look down upon their families and give them peace. We thank you, Father, for the ability that you have given to each and every one of us to serve you. And we ask, Lord, that we use that ability to edify your high and holy name, to spread your word, to plant the seed. Help us, Father, um, learn what to say and how to act. We pray that you would glance this morning as he uh, brings to us another message from your word. Bless him and his family. We thank you for his years of service also. We pray, Father, for uh, Jim and Bell, David and Bell, and uh, ask your blessings upon them as they begin their work here. Most importantly, Father, we thank you for Jesus, for the hope that we have in him. For it's in his name we pray.
Now, I am a parent of two wonderfully wild and crazy kids. <laughs> and as a parent, I do worry a lot. Uh, my worry leads me to do things that might not make sense or uh, cause me to act more paranoid than I usually do. Uh, for example, if there is a terrible storm at night, I stay up late when it comes over. Um, I do that because I want to keep my family safe. So when this virus popped up, I started keeping up with the numbers um, for our state. It, it doesn't really matter to me personally uh, if it's a conspiracy or not because I will always err to the side of caution when it comes to protecting my family. I do wish the virus was a hoax though. <laughs> Now the other day, our governor, Ohio, said that we need to sacrifice today for a better tomorrow. The key word there was sacrifice. You know how hard it is to sacrifice anything for any cause? You need to have a great deal of patience, and you have to trust. Now I don't always put my trust in people or earthly things but I do trust my Lord. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. If there was ever a time to trust our Lord, that time is now. He knows sacrifice more than we could ever imagine. He sacrificed everything, his body and his blood, because he wanted to protect his family which is all of us from sin. The only true sacrifice we can make is for us to sacrifice our time and energy to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can lead us and protect us from anything that makes us fear. If I could change one thing the governor said from that speech he gave the other day, it would be this. Sacrifice for the Lord today, for he will lead you to a better tomorrow. Let us give thanks for the prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the sacrifice that your son did when he came down to die on the cross for us. It shows how much his love and patience for us as his people. He will always be with us, and we thank you so we thank your son so much for everything he has ever done. Let's remember the blood that was shed on the cross. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you again, thanking you for your Son and the sacrifice he made by dying on that cross. The blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. Let us always remember the sacrifices he made for us so that we can be better, so we can follow his lead. In Jesus' name. As you may know, we um, don't have our trays in the back and, and up front here um, whenever you have a chance to, uh, whenever you have a chance to get a, a portion of what we did bless with us, um, give thanks for the blessing to us. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, you, we are a blessed people because of how much you care and how much you sacrifice for us each and every day to give us a life, to give us a life to live for you, for the sacrifices our Lord made for us. Thank you so much, Lord. Please bless this for all the great things this church do, uh, um, does and continues to do for the community of Dover and out in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. <laughs>
satisfy my soul like you. So would you please stand as we sing this song, remain standing for the scripture reading that will follow. Some of us may have another idea. <laughs> surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's be seated. Once again, it is my honor and pleasure to be here with you this morning. That was back on March 22nd when I was here. That was the last service you had in this building until a couple months later. But I'm glad that we're able to do this now, even in the midst of things that are still not good. Things are still not right uh, with this nation and in the world, but we pray that those kinds of things, the things involving our physical lives and uh, families and so on, will be straightened out and be back to more of a normalcy uh, in the very near future. It is good to see all of you this morning, and I'm especially glad to get a chance to see David and Bella they realized that they would be here as they get ready to start their work here. We're moving in on August the 2nd. That's the day before my birthday. <laughs> August the 3rd. I'll be 71 years old on that day. So I know I didn't look it. <laughs> I've been blessed. But good to see Randy and Jeanette also. They weren't supposed to be here. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that they're here this morning. There's a great deal in this life, in this world, that kind of discourages us. It's easy to get discouraged, easy to get depressed. We're hearing a lot in regards to the virus and its consequences about mental health, mental situations along with the physical. And certainly there are people who have a legitimate reason besides what's happening right now. A legitimate reason to be discouraged, a legitimate reason to be Depressed. Not everyone can be happy all the time. As a matter of fact, let me say that no one can be happy all the time. But here's where we must make a distinction. And that's the distinction I want to draw, especially in the lesson today. We have to recognize that there's a difference between being happy and being content. There is a difference between those two. 
the antidote to the stresses of life, the ultimate cure for discouragement and depression, the way to separate ourselves from anxiety is to develop contentment. That's really what Paul tells us here in the Philippian letter, tells the Philippian Christians originally. Because happiness is an elusive goal at best. And its attainment varies from individual to individual. Contentment is an attainable goal. And the keys to developing it will work in anyone's life. Let's look a little further in chapter 4 of Philippians. Verses beginning in verse 10, going down through verse 13. Where Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now, at last, your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. The Philippian letter is sometimes referred to as Paul's letter of joy. Forms of the word joy or rejoice appear again and again in this epistle. In fact, 16 times as he writes to the church that he helped to establish and with which he obviously had a very warm social, personal, spiritual relationship. But the Philippian letter is also one of the so-called prison epistles. Written during the time of Paul's imprisonment in Rome between the years A.D. 60 and 62, we believe. Here he was, isolated from people that he worked with. People that he loved and who loved him. Kept a prisoner in the very seat of pagan power. And in spite of all this, in spite of his circumstances, Paul says, I am content. And we need to understand what Paul was writing here. And his original hearers, those who first received this letter, would have understood this probably better than we do because of they, their knowledge of the language. The word translated content in verse 11 of chapter 4 means sufficient in oneself, adequate, Needing no assistance. That's the word that Paul uses here. Paul assures the brethren that despite his situation, he's doing well. Despite the circumstances, he's getting along. They need not worry about him. And Paul reassures the Philippians. I have no need. I'm all right. I'm content. The key to his contentment you find in verse 6. Where he says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's the key to his contentment. Don't be concerned. Don't be distressed. Take things to God. Talk to God. But the key to his joy is found in verse 13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the key to his joy. Our modern English word content is defined slightly differently. And that's what I said a moment ago, why I said that the original hearers and readers of this letter would have had a little different impression of what Paul was talking about than what we might. Because our word in English, content, is defined as not inclined to complain. If I'm content with something, I'm not complaining about it. Or to desire something else. To be satisfied. To be submissive to circumstances. To accept one's circumstances. That's what we talk about as being content. And it's not so much the idea of having no needs. 
but of being resigned to what we have or the situation in which we find ourselves. Since I can't change my circumstances, I must learn to accept them and live with them. Since we can't change the circumstances of this time in which we live right now and have lived over these past months, we have to adapt to them. We have to accept them until something different happens. But what's the difference between this and being happy? Happy signifies that even enjoyment, doesn't it? Pleasure. The circumstances of our lives can create happiness. Certain situations for us can create happiness. We're happy in because there are things that we like, things that we enjoy. That may have nothing to do with anyone else's life, anyone else's happiness, because our needs in that regard, our desires in that regard, what makes us happy is different for people. But the circumstances of our lives can also create unhappiness. Anxiety. They can bring on discouragement, even so far as to drop into depression. Happiness is a state of mind that varies upon, based upon our personal likes and dislikes, our needs and our wants, what happens to us or doesn't happen to us. So what I'm saying is, happiness is self-centered. It has to do with us as an individual. Again, what makes me happy might have no effect in your life whatsoever. What makes you happy may not affect me. That's a personal thing. It is self-centered. Contentment, though, let's draw the contrast here. Contentment is a state of mind that's dependent upon our acceptance of and our adjustment to what happens or doesn't happen in our lives. Let me say that again. Contentment is a state of mind that depends upon our acceptance or our adjustment to what happens or doesn't happen in our lives. We may not like what happens or doesn't happen, but we live with it, we resign ourselves to it, and we trust God to know what is best and to provide that which is good and right. And so here's the difference. Happiness is self-centered. Contentment is God-centered. It's God-centered. And that's what Paul's writing about here. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Be satisfied with what you have. Be satisfied with your circumstances. Because it's not the circumstances that determine whether or not you're accepting. It's how you view it in relation to God and your relationship with God. The same Greek word is used there in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. It's in a different form. But the same Greek word is used for contentment in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6, as Paul uses here in Philippians 4.11. It's a state of mind that's independent of all outward external circumstances. It comes only from within. Because remember, here's a man imprisoned, held captive, possibly facing death. And yet he says, I'm content. Because it has nothing to do with his circumstances. It has nothing to do with where he is, what's happening to him. It has to do with his relationship with God. Instead of seeking to be happy, we ought to seek to be content. What we describe as unhappiness is really often just discontent. That's what we really ought to say. To develop contentment is to overcome anxiety, is to overcome discouragement, it's even to overcome depression. So how do we develop that state of mind? Is it really possible what are the keys to contentment? We go back again to Philippians 4, in verses 6 and 7. Life in this world for everyone creates problems and concerns. 
Life creates problems and concerns. You know, it's, it's interesting the older you get, you look back on certain times. And even as you as you grow older, it doesn't have to be an old age. You say, boy, I wish we could get back in that time. It's nostalgia of a sort. But you know what nostalgia is? It's the past without pain. We don't remember the difficult things. We don't remember the bad things. We remember the good things. Well, I wish I could go back to those days when all I had to do was and fill in the blanks. But you know, a lot of times it's because we were younger in those days and we didn't have the responsibilities we have today. That was a good time because I didn't have to take the responsibility that I have to take today. I didn't have to pay the bills. When I was growing up, it wasn't my responsibility was to, to make sure that everything was taken care of. And so I can go back and say that was a great time in my life. Every life has its good days and bad days. Every life has its trials and difficulties, as well as its joys and its pleasures. That's the nature of life in this world. Life's goal should be to have that peace of God which surpasses all understanding that, that Paul mentions here in verse 7. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That's the peace that will carry us through this life into eternal life. Jesus said this, John 14, verse 27. My peace I give to you. Now think about when he said that and to whom he said that. First of all, when he said it. He was about to go to the cross. He knew it. He was about to face the most horrible death that anyone could imagine. And he knew it. He's talking to the apostles. At that time, the 11, since Judas has already left the scene, in that upper room on the evening before his death. My peace I give to you. How could anyone be at peace under those circumstances? How could anyone feel that way? But Jesus said he did. And he wanted to pass that on to his apostles. Of course, what he's trying to do in that whole dissertation that you find in the Gospel of John, he's trying to prepare them as well as teach them, but prepare them for what was about to happen. And the fact that he was going to die. He was going to be separated from them. And so many of the things that people had looked forward to in the Messiah were, to them, going to come to an end. And so he said, you have to remember certain things. He talks to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He talks to them about the fact that he had to die before that happened. He talks to them about having a settled mind during this very stressful period. We can't, though, have real contentment. We can't know real peace apart from our relationship with God, and that's what Jesus had above all else. I love the verse in John 13. Right at the beginning of all of this discussion, where it says that Jesus knew where he came from, he knew who it was. He knew where he was going. That's all that mattered. No matter what anybody said about him, and oh, they said some terrible things. No matter how he was mocked, disbelieved, treated badly, shunned, it didn't make any difference because I know who I am. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Even if they won't recognize it, I know all of these things. And I know that my Father is with me. Even on this night, before his horrendous death, I am at peace. And I want to give that to you. He says to the apostles. We let our requests be made known to God. Remember how he finishes this whole discussion in John 17 with prayer. What I would refer to, I think most correctly, as the Lord's Prayer. 
Because it's Jesus praying to his Father about himself, about his apostles, and about all the disciples that are going to follow. Let your request be made known to God. We turn things over to him. We use the keys to contentment. And there are three that I want to focus in on in just the last few moments here. Key number one. God cares. God cares. That's a key to contentment. Never let Satan inject doubt into your mind regarding God's love for us because he tries to do that all the time. He doesn't really care about you. He doesn't really care about your circumstances. Yes, he does. When we get discouraged, when sin slips into depression or slips us into depression, when our worries overwhelm us, that's when Satan whispers to us, God doesn't care. He doesn't care about all of this. We're God's most precious possession. Human beings, we're God's most precious possession. His greatest desire is for our salvation. His greatest desire is for our peace of mind. Be content in knowing that He cares for me. No matter what the circumstances of life, I can't get away from God. I can drift into sin. I can do maybe some terrible things, but I cannot get out of the sight of God. Nor can I get out of forgiveness from God if I seek that, no matter where I've been in my life. Then there's a second key, and it's He comforts and He controls. He cares. He also comforts and controls. It's a man traveling through the night on a train in a violent storm. The lightning flashed and the rain lashed against the windows driven by such a forceful wind. And the passengers could see as the lightning flashed. As they traveled in this train, they could see water rising toward the railroad tracks. It was such a tremendous storm. There was only one young lady who didn't seem to be disturbed by the circumstances in which they found themselves. And this man asked her a question. He said, why aren't you concerned? We're all concerned about what might happen. We need to get through this, but we're, we're really concerned about this. You, you don't appear to be. And her answer was very simple. She said, well, I know we're going to be all right because my father is the engineer. He'll get us through. Can you think of a similar circumstance from the Bible itself like that? Here's Jesus and the apostles out on the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee was notorious for the suddenness with which storms sometimes arose. And as they were traveling on this large lake, that very thing happened. A violent storm came. And the boat was tossed about in that rough water, rising on the waves and down into the swales. And as that all happened, water started to pour into the boat. And the apostles were very much afraid that the boat was going to sink. Very much afraid that they were going to die in this storm. But there was only one person on the boat who didn't show any concern. As a matter of fact, not only did he not show concern, he was asleep. Asleep in the back of the boat. Have you ever had someone say to you on a, in the morning, did you hear that storm last night? Wasn't that a terrible storm? And you say, no, I didn't hear a thing. Sometimes you can be so soundly asleep that you don't know or hear what's happening around you. And here was Jesus in that very situation. But remember, he had that peace with Pat's understanding. He knew everything was going to be all right. But the apostles didn't. And they're there. They, and I could just imagine... <laughs> They're trying to bail the boat. The helmsman's trying to keep the boat on some kind of course as it's tossed back and forth. They turn around, or someone turns around and looks and sees Jesus back there. And so one of the apostles, or maybe a number of them, go back and, and, and shake him and stir him and say, get up. And what is it that they ask him? What's the question they posed to him? Teacher, do you not care? 
that we're perishing? Do you not care that we're going to die, possibly? And the teacher got up. Probably had to stagger up. Because that boat was rocking pretty good. He didn't answer that question directly, but simply spoke the words, peace be still. Of course, they marveled at what happened as a result of that. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm, Mark says in Mark 4.39. There is a peace, there is assurance, because... God cares. God's in control. And God comforts. And we just have to go to Him for those things and understand that He provides those things. The Father's hand is on the throne. His word calms the storm. He is the God of heaven and earth, of all nature, the Almighty God. God is present always to comfort, to strengthen, to encourage. We just need to let him know we need that. Now, he knows our needs. I don't, don't misunderstand. He knows what our needs are. But he wants us to approach him with it. Jesus did that. He approached his father often. He went off by himself to pray. Talked to his father. Even as the son of God, he needed that constant relationship. Because he was away from home. You realize when Jesus was in this world, he was away from home? This, is, this wasn't his home. His home was heaven. He'd come from there. He was going back there. But while he was in the world, he needed to keep contact with home. Reach out by faith. Take his hand. Take God's hand. And look at him for reassurance in the darkest days of life because he'll provide. Now today, not by words put in your head, but right here. Right here, the word of God. This is God speaking to us. He's there and he's in control. Be content in knowing that. At times we might feel like the individual who wrote something called a psalm in a hotel room. Here's how it goes. I'm alone, Lord. Alone. A thousand miles from home. There's no one here who knows my name except the clerk, and he spelled it wrong. No one to eat dinner with. Laugh at my jokes. Listen to my gripes. Be happy with me about what happened today and say, that's great. No one cares. There's just this lousy bed and slush in the street outside between the buildings. I feel sorry for myself, and I have plenty of reason to. Maybe I ought to say I'm on top of it. Praise the Lord. Things are great, but they're not. Tonight, it's all gray slush. I don't think there's a one of us who's lived any length of time that can't remember the days that were gray slush. No one seemed to care. If we didn't have anybody to share it with, we were alone. But you know, we're never alone. We are never alone. There's a God who loves us, who cares about us, who will comfort us, who is in control. And then key number three. God knows. He knows exactly what's happening in every one of our lives at all times. He knows me personally. That can be a comforting, it can be a frightening thing. He knows me so well, he says, Jesus said that God knows us so well, he knows the number of hairs on our head. I'm making it easier for God because I'm losing most of mine. He doesn't have to count as God. What's, what's Jesus saying? Jesus said, God knows you better than you know yourself. Because he made you. He sustains you. He loves you. He knows how I feel. 
He knows what will make me better. So Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And I admit that's a tall order. As human beings, that's a tall, tall order to not, not to worry. We have a tendency to worry about anything and everything. But when it comes to our spiritual life, when it comes to our connection with God, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God who surpasses all of us now, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Father, again, you know, as you know everything about your creation, about us, you know how hard it is at times to be upbeat, to be content. How difficult the struggles of life can become. With seemingly no way out, and yet there's always a way out through you. And Father, we're grateful for the fact that you do care. You know at times we don't understand that, we don't recognize that. Satan is telling us differently. You care. And caring, you want to go. Father, we need to go to you, we know, to get that concern, that help, that comfort. Because above all, you want us to be with you forever. Be with you in heaven. To live eternally. And Father, we know that there's instruction given in your word as to how that can be. Father, we thank you for the simplicity of your gospel. The simplicity of what you have told us that we must do in order to have eternal life and showed us through your son your very nature as he that he's in the world and as he said if you see me you see me father thank you father for your blessings you do provide every good gift and every perfect gift that comes to us thank you for strengthening us in the difficult times Helping us in our weaknesses, forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we pray for those who have not yet named the name of your Son as their Lord and their Savior, not yet followed the very simple direction of the gospel. To come to you, to confess their fact, the fact that they're sinners, to be immersed for the forgiveness of sins. We pray for those who would yet do that, that they might come to an understanding of what that means and what to do. But Father, thank you that we also, when we become a child of yours, have a means by which we can, again, be restored in our relationship with you if such needs to be the case. Thank you, Father, for all of your love. And Father, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. One of the greatest benefits we get from the Bible is perspective. When we get discouraged, when we're fearful, we lose our perspective. Everything is now. Everything is right here. It's, it's easy, to lose, easy to lose our perspective. Little things become big things. A light irritation becomes an annoying pebble in our shoe. We take it around with us and we take it out on those around us. Our motivation disappears, our hope departs. And God's word is made for just that kind of time. It sends light through the darkness. It offers safety instead of fear. The Bible gives us the bigger picture. The Bible gives us a different perspective. And that's what we have to keep in mind. There's more to life than what we experience right here. We need to look at the bigger picture. People search long and do much to be happy. But the real joy of life lies in finding contentment 
And that's only in one way. Through Christ who strengthens me. This morning, if you never named the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never expressed your desire to repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of those sins, there's time and opportunity to do that very thing. I know there are those here who will assist you with that. Maybe you have other needs. Maybe you need to come back to God. Having been one of his children and being one of his children, we never stop being one of his children when we obey the gospel. But maybe we've heard, maybe we've fallen away. We need to come home. And God is waiting for you to do that, if that's the case. Whatever your need is this morning, won't you come as we stand? As we stand.
are visiting again, please, uh, you are our honored guest today, and please fill out one of our business cards. So. We'll sing uh, Hosanna, and then uh, Brother Butch will have our closing prayer. I don't know if I remember what they did with this song, but we'll just leave it something for this. <laughs> sickness that you have given the medical profession to bring so many through ailments. Lord, we thank you for that. And we go into this new week with the assurance that we can rest our cares upon you. You will keep us safe as we travel, as we work, and as we live in your community. Pray now in Jesus' name. 